Hey guys, welcome to December's based episode. I hope you had a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, or just Happy Holiday season in general. I will never in my life understand the people who get pressed when people say Happy Holidays. Like, sorry, I don't think the world is all about me and my religion, and I want others to also enjoy their traditions in the season. Why does that get people so worked up? For me, I'm looking forward to my two favorite holidays this week, my birthday, and then the next day, New Year's Eve. I have a terribly timed birthday because it often just gets forgotten in between Christmas and New Year's Eve. And actually, during college, I had this great idea to move it to October 17th, which I have to say was a much better birthday. So if you're in the baby making business, try and time it so your kids has a good birthday. And either way, you can give me a nice birthday present by sharing the show, liking and commenting, or leaving a five-star review. For our last episode of 2021, can you believe that? I have a topic that I think a lot of you are going to find very timely. We're going to be talking about public, or as I like to call them, government schools. One of my very first episodes of BASE looked at the ways government wrecked the higher education model, and that episode has been one of the most popular in the series. After I released it, I had a lot of requests for me to go back and give the K through 12 model the same kind of microscope. I think those requests have only become more timely over the past year as parents have increasingly dealt with lockdowns, teachers unions, school boards, bullying by the FBI, and a wide range of COVID era practices in the classroom that have left many looking for an escape route. What you may not know about me is that though I do not have kids, I consider educational freedom to be one of the top issues in our political system because we cannot hope to have a functioning society without an educated populace. And honey, these government schools are not providing it. I also have an interesting background when it comes to this subject. I was homeschooled exclusively at home through fifth grade. I then attended what's known as a cottage school from sixth through eighth grade. I went to a top private school in Louisville for ninth and 10th grade. And then when we moved to South Carolina when I was 16, my parents put all of us in public school where I finished out high school. I'll explain what I learned from those experiences as we progress, but just know my experience spans the gap when it comes to educational options. I've also worked pretty extensively on this issue from a public policy perspective. In Tennessee, I helped pass the state's first school choice program back in 2016, and I've continued to advocate for and write about this subject ever since, just so that you know where I'm coming from when I approach the subject. I firmly believe that this is another big issue the left and right could come together on if we quit talking past each other and actually got down to the root cause of the problem and then negotiated. Because I think the vast majority of people can agree we want our kids to be educated, to have equal opportunities, and for our society to thrive. So today, we're going back to the beginning, as always. We're going to look at how primary education has evolved in this country, the ways it was broken, and the solutions we can now come together on to fix this. So let's go. There is no doubt that education was always considered important in America. Many of the founding fathers expounded upon that belief in their works. Thomas Jefferson said, I think by far the most important bill in our whole code is that for the diffusion of knowledge among the people. No other sure foundation can be devised for the preservation of freedom and happiness. So right away, you can see from that quote that they knew education was not only important, but essential if our country were to have the intelligence and wisdom it needed to safeguard our freedoms. Jefferson also believed that education prevented aristocracy and would ensure that the U.S. moved towards a meritocracy. He wrote, instead of an aristocracy of wealth, of more harm and danger than benefit to society, to make an opening for the aristocracy of virtue and talent, which nature has wisely provided for the direction of the interests of society and scattered with equal hand through all of its conditions, was deemed essential to a well-ordered republic. And he recognized that in many countries, talent and genius is laid to waste simply by means of the class one is born into. He said, the object of my education bill was to bring into action that mass of talents which lies buried in poverty in every country for want of the means of development and thus give activity to the mass of mind, which in proportion to our population shall be the double or treble of what it is in most countries. I love that. Lastly, and one of my favorite quotes by him, Jefferson said, an educated citizenry is a vital requisite for our survival as a free people. Pretty bold. Another founder, Samuel Adams, said, if virtue and knowledge are diffused among the people, they will never be enslaved. This will be their great security. 
You see the notion that education is essential for freedom to be preserved repeated often. It is a means of security for the ideals we were founded upon because educated, intelligent people will fight for freedom for all. They will ascribe to higher notions and they will better understand the economics that they are working with in their system. The list goes on. Benjamin Franklin said, a Bible and a newspaper in every house, a good school in every district, all studied and appreciated as they merit, are the principal support of virtue, morality, and civil liberty. So you get the picture. I could go on and on. Uh, these men talked themselves blue in the face about education. And as you can see by these quotes above, they all agreed that education was vital, essential, and imperative for us to hang on to what they built. Why? Because people who are not educated are easily fooled, tricked out of their possessions and liberties, susceptible to demagogues, and unable to adequately participate in a representative democracy because they lack the ability to think critically, to process, to think 10 steps ahead, to truly understand the consequences of public policies without an education. And for most of history, education was provided in the home, unless you were very rich. Which is why it always cracks me up when people act like homeschooling or co-ops are so edgy or experimental. Like, no, ma'am, that's how it's mostly been done throughout history. The experimental thing is the government schools, and it's going pretty badly. But let's run the history back on this country. During the colonial years, and for almost 100 years after our formal existence as a nation, education was kind of a hodgepodge. There were some public schools, some religious schools, and many Americans were taught at home. But we did not mandate school and the education system was not centralized. That means the structure was mostly voluntary and managed and funded locally, giving parents a lot of control. In the 1600s, the first settlers created the Massachusetts Bay Colony and then created the country's first education system. At that time, most of the education was still provided in the home or by religious institutions with a focus on teaching kids Puritan values and to read the Bible. The elite sent some of their sons to Latin schools for formal education, and in 1635, the first free public school was opened in Boston, which was funded by tax dollars, so it wasn't really free. In 1647, Massachusetts created a law known as the Old Deluder Satan Act, which I just think is such an ironic name, and this required towns with populations of 50 or more to hire a schoolmaster to teach the children of the town basic academics. As you can see, Education was very important in New England, and they influenced other colonies where local schools continued to open for the next 100 years. Many of these settlers were educated in the Puritan traditions themselves, and they thought education was important to carry on their religious beliefs. Notably, though, they only prized education for white kids and more for boys than girls. Girls were often taught separately and less thoroughly, like being taught to read but not to write, as one example. In the South, however, public schools were less common during the 1600s and 1700s, and really, they did not become widespread until after the Civil War. Affluent families down there typically paid private tutors or they sent their sons abroad. After the Revolution, Thomas Jefferson argued that there should be a formal education system and that taxpayer dollars should be used to support it. But it would still be some time before that came to fruition. Thomas Jefferson, as a philosopher and certainly not as a person, is one of my favorite founding fathers. But I want to take this opportunity to point out that he was a sellout just like the majority of people, and as soon as he acquired power, most of his limited government posturing was out the window. According to the Cato Institute, the federal government has only specific enumerated powers primarily found in Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, and the authority to spend money on education outside of federal lands or territories is not among them. But Jefferson seemed to think that as long as he was the one carrying out the government. There was no problem with his power, size, influence, or stepping over the constraints of the Constitution. And that seems to happen to a lot of people who fail to realize that the root problem of power is in power itself, not just in the person who wields it. Rant over. Back to the timeline. In 1837, Massachusetts created the first State Board of Education. And throughout the 1800s, more and more towns started creating schoolhouses. They typically consisted of a single room that housed all grades, a single school teacher who was usually an unmarried woman, and they focused on reading, writing, arithmetic, and uh, good manners. Worth noting, these schools were not free. Parents paid tuition for these schools, provided housing for the school teacher, or contributed other commodities in exchange for their children being allowed to attend the school. In operation, they actually functioned a lot more like modern day co-ops. In 1852, we see the dawn of compulsory education. Massachusetts passed such a law first, and then New York followed the next year. By 1918, every state would pass such requirements. 
But while these laws made it illegal to not send your kids to school, they did not mandate that parents had to use public schools. They still got their pick of homeschooling, private or religious schools, or public schools. In 1867, under President Andrew Johnson, we see the federal government get its dirty hands on education with the creation of the Federal Department of Education. Dum, dum, dum. The original purpose of the agency, allegedly, was to collect information on individual schools that would help states establish their own effective public school systems. And that brings us to the era of Reconstruction, which was the period of time after the Civil War, during which schools became a real battleground politically. Black people naturally sought their place in the public education system, and the 14th Amendment, which mandates all citizens be treated equally under the law, meant that states could not block them from accessing schools. But the U.S. Supreme Court got maliciously crafty, as it be doing, and used the case Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896 to establish the concept of separate but equal, ushering in decades of segregation to America's schools. By 1900, 78% of all American children between the ages of 5 and 17 were enrolled in schools, but only 11% of all children were enrolled in high school and even fewer graduated. Schools didn't take up that much time. The school year usually lasted 150 days or less, and children attended for a few hours a day as they were still needed to perform manual labor in most scenarios. But during the early 1900s, our society began to change. Up until this time, we had mostly been a rural agricultural society. But as the Industrialized Revolution began to take hold, many felt our nation's workforce was not being adequately prepared for the future jobs that would need to be filled. Let me translate that for you here. I want to be very clear. We needed a complacent, subservient population that would be trained to leave the home, go into factories five days a week, eight hours a day, perform mind-numbingly monotonous tasks, and do exactly what it was told by supervisors without thinking to question its existence. So some changes needed to be made to the way we were schooling people, okay? It's not by accident that public schools are structured as they are, with kids sitting in desks on a work-type schedule with strict rules and the expectance that they will conform to the crowd. Think about it. And the structure has the added political benefit of providing free childcare so that more people can work outside the home while the government indoctrinates, I mean, raises your kids. Once people got used to that structure, it became much harder for them to choose schooling alternatives. And then throughout the 1910s, public schools became increasingly responsible for vocational training. In earlier years, young people had been apprenticed to experienced workers known as journeymen in order to receive on-the-job training. That system fell apart with the growth of labor unions, which placed formal limits on the number of apprentices a company could hire. It was left to the public schools to then take up the slack in vocational training. One day, one day, y'all are gonna listen when I tell you how problematic our unions are in this country. Go back and watch the base episode on them if you haven't yet. Don't have the time to get my union busting high horse today, but they make me so mad. This is a big deal. For most of history, we prepared people for the workplace in the most obvious, common sense, and economical way possible. We let them train on the job. Instead of wasting years and years learning a ton of things you probably will never need, going into debt, and taking a guess at age 18 with no experience on what kind of jobs you might actually like, we used to do this novel thing where you got to go work alongside a professional and see if you liked the job, if you were cut out for it. You even got to make some money while you were doing the training. And the person training you also got cheaper labor in exchange for training you. This is the best way to actually learn a skill. It prevents people from wasting time and money on fields where they will ultimately not probably fit. It also prevents people from going into debt. The bottom line is you should not have to jump through all of the hoops our modern society built for you just to work a freaking job. Most people do not need to go to school for 20 plus years to function in society. But thanks to the government and unions, those avenues have been continuously stripped away and Americans have been pushed into the public education system like a bunch of fat cows being led to slaughter. And I want to be clear, I think there is value in a liberal arts education. I had one. It makes you a more well-rounded, cultural person. But that shouldn't be tied to a job or cost $40,000 a year. It should be provided in the home or self-taught or a simple class you pay a reasonable amount for. And I shouldn't have to waste years of my life taking advanced math and science when it was clear early on that I did not excel in these fields and would obviously not choose a path in them. Instead, I should have been able to obtain the basic knowledge needed, maybe sixth or seventh grade level, and then focus my time on becoming an expert in subjects I would actually use. And if schools weren't so focused on making every kid uniformly go through these subjects, providing a liberal arts education and training people for vocations, perhaps 
they would actually teach kids the things they need to function in society that they currently don't get, like money management, investing, basic civics, and household management, the novelty. Anyways, back to the timeline. In 1914, Congress starts entwining itself with state schools through a number of legislative acts. You know the federal government is not going to stay in its place in this scenario. First, you have the Smith-Lever Act of 1914, which offered federal dollars for extension courses in agriculture and home economics. Then you had the Smith-Hughes Act following in 1917, which granted funds directly to schools for the teaching of agricultural, industrial, and commercial courses. By the close of the decade, the federal government made available $3 billion for the training and salaries of vocational teachers, federal supervisory tasks, and research about vocational education. Follow the money and see where it goes, as they say in Hamilton. You'll see the way the federal government seeps into schools is by offering money, like a carrot, that it will then threaten to take away should schools not do what it wants. We're going to dig into the money much deeper in a minute, but for reference's sake, know that in 1915, an average of $8.50 was spent on each child in the Southern school compared to $22.19 per child in the North. So from the very beginning, the South has always lagged the North in educational standards. But while all children in the South lagged behind their Northern counterparts, thanks to the separate but equal garbage, black kids in the region suffered the most. According to the U.S. Census of 1910, 90% of the black population resided in the South at that time. Black public schools remained open only three to four months per year, and minority teachers were paid about $17 to $25 per month, which was less than the salaries of black convicts. This led to a pretty infamous debate between black intellectuals at the time. Booker T. Washington opened his Tuskegee Institute, funded by Northern white philanthropists, which taught black students vocational skills. He was actually opposed by W.E.B. Du Bois and a group that became the NAACP, who all felt that he was conditioning these students for a lifetime of indentured servitude. Washington fought back and thought that a vocational training was better than the paltry education these kids would get in the public schools. And I think they both actually kind of had a point. Anyways, now we're in the 1920s and the progressive era is in full swing. And by progressive, I do mean socialist. There's a baby boom after soldiers return home from the First World War. And the focus on education plus the population increase leads to a much higher enrollment in public schools and a building boom in the districts. We really see a movement away from people being schooled in the home and public schools now dwarf private options. Progressives like John Dewey had great influence during this era. And I actually like some of what Dewey had to say. For one example, he pushed for student-led classes and advocated for more vocational-based education programs. But he also worked with other progressives of the time to build a new social order, and they published a provocative journal called The Social Frontier to advance their reconstructionist critique of laissez-faire capitalism. They also launched the Teachers College at Columbia University, where students of Dewey taught the principles of progressive education to thousands of teachers and school leaders. As you should be able to surmise from all of this, the classroom was quickly becoming a political battleground, and progressives were not the only ones showing up for the war. In 1925, we get the infamous Scopes Monkey Trial. This trial involved a high school science teacher in Tennessee who stood accused of teaching evolution despite a state law that forbade the teaching of material that contradicted the Bible. While a lot of the curriculum spats of the era seemed to revolve around concepts like religion or democracy, when you boil it down, most really came down to a fight over teaching the ideals we were founded upon, capitalism, limited government, and liberty for all, versus teaching communism, collectivism, and the common good. Then in 1929, we have the Great Depression. It kind of wipes out a lot of things. By 1932, many Americans could not afford to pay their property taxes, which is largely how schools are funded. And this led to almost 20,000 schools closing their doors. But don't worry, FDR is in office now, so things are about to get a lot worse. Under his New Deal package, FDR gets two new programs that influence public education. The Civilian Conservation Corps, or the CCC, and the National Youth Administration, the NYA, which were both established in 1933. According to reporting by The Advocate, the CCC administered a temporary work assistance program and the NYA administered two programs. The first, a work relief and employment program for the needy and those out of school. The second, a part-time employment assistance program for needy high school and college students. At one point, approximately 750,000 students were enrolled in the NYA program, but it slowly dawned on the officials of both the CCC and the NYA that many of the participants lacked basic skills like reading, writing, and arithmetic, as well as vocational skills. So for the first time in history of the nation, the federal government began to offer education courses primarily in these basic skills. So the money between the federal government and the school system is just getting even more entangled. And remember, there is no such thing as a free lunch. 
During this time, and largely in response to budget cuts, membership in teachers' unions such as the American Federation of Teachers, or the AFT, and the National Education Association, or the NEA, increase rapidly. More on those guys later. All of this led to the social reconstructionist movement, which believed that through schools, American life could be changed for the better. As in, they thought they could kill capitalism, teach collectivism, and usher in a new world order. Some reconstructionists encouraged teachers to join in socialist or communist labor organizing. Teachers, unions, and other progressives also began lobbying for more state control over schools during this time, and they got it. Between 1930 and 1940, the proportion of school budgets supported by the state nearly doubled to 30% of all funding. And with that, localities began to lose more and more control of their schools, their curriculum, and their children's future. The Second World War takes place in the 1940s, meaning most of our focus was abroad, and when it was over, we enter the period of the Red Scare, meaning people were freaked out about communists, as they should be, and much of the progressives' progress in the 20s and 30s came to a halt in the schools. And then, in 1954, we get the next most significant action in our public school system, Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, which was a Supreme Court decision that overturned the very racist, separate but equal system invented earlier under Plessy versus Ferguson. And that's how racism ended, guys. <laughs> Psych. Desegregation did not come easily. In fact, it took over a decade to officially implement, and I would argue still hasn't totally taken place. In 1956, Tennessee Governor Frank Clement calls in the National Guard after white mobs attempt to block the desegregation of a high school. The next year, the KKK and other white supremacists bombed an elementary school in Nashville that was desegregating. Also in 1956, white students and residents riot at the University of Alabama when a black student enrolls. That student is suspended and later expelled for criticizing the university. And in Virginia, the legislature calls for massive resistance to school desegregation and pledges to close schools under desegregation orders. I could keep going. This kind of crap happens all over the place during this time. In 1958, the Supreme Court rules that fear of social unrest or violence, whether real or constructed by those wishing to oppose integration, does not excuse state governments from complying with the Brown decision. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act is adopted, which among other things prohibits discrimination in programs and activities receiving federal financial assistance, which of course includes schools. In 1968, the Supreme Court orders states to dismantle segregated school systems root and branch because uh, they weren't doing it. In 1969, the Supreme Court declares that desegregation speed standards are no longer constitutionally permissible and orders the immediate desegregation of Mississippi schools. In 1971, the Supreme Court approves busing, magnet schools, compensatory education, and other tools as appropriate remedies to overcome the role of residential segregation in perpetuating racially segregated schools. But none of that works all that well because white people move to the suburbs in large numbers and or put their kids in private schools to avoid desegregated schools and the effects of busing, which is a movement known as white flight. I just have to remind you here because it frankly blows my mind that all of this was occurring while my parents were alive. This is not some distant thing that happened. Many of the people responsible are still alive. Some are still in office. And this is what drives me nuts about the right, which claims to know that the government is corrupt and terrible, but quickly rushes to its defense whenever we say it's systemically racist. Like seriously, examine that. Your logic doesn't wash. We had centuries of racist laws and practices on the books, and those things don't all just magically disappear with a Supreme Court decision, as you can see by the fact that they kept issuing more and more decisions for decades, basically saying the same thing that the Brown decision said. These events were also not that long ago and far away, like so many like to pretend, because it absolves your conscience somehow, I guess. We might not have put these things into motion, but if you do nothing to stop their effects and implications now, you are complicit. So do something. And because I'm an equal opportunity hypocrisy caller outer, I've got something to say to the left too. Government schools are one of the most systemically racist institutions in this country, and y'all go to bat for them like they're your mom. It makes no sense. Do you stand for kids, especially kids of color, and their opportunities in this country, or do you stand for the teachers unions that pad your pockets with their blood money? Because I think I know the answer. In case there's anyone still on the fence here about just how racially disparate our educational system actually is by design, let's break this down. Not only did we have two centuries of overtly racist policies that determined what kids got access to what kinds of education, since Brown versus Board of Education, we've had another nearly 70 years of quietly racist government policies that have continued to produce disparate outcomes in public schools. 
It's important to know this. Where a child goes to school is determined by their zip code. That's true to this day, and it's a very big deal. Why, you may ask? A number of reasons. First, schools are funded largely based off of property taxes. Ipso facto, wealthier neighborhoods have wealthier public schools and therefore better education outcomes, which of course largely determines a kid's future earning potential. According to the U.S. Senate, housing's relationship to schools is a policy choice. Districts have traditionally drawn school boundaries by neighborhood and assigned students to schools by home address, even when other options are more convenient or appealing to families. Meanwhile, residential zoning regulations control the type, size, and amount of homes built in different school zones and segregate cities by income within and across metropolitan areas. Research finds housing characteristics vary systemically across school zones with larger houses and single-family homes more common within high-performing school boundaries and larger housing cost gaps exist across high and low-quality schools in areas with more restrictive residential zoning. For the record, in 1972, the Supreme Court found that there is no constitutional right to an education, which I agree with, and that the 14th Amendment does not require precisely equal advantages in school funding in a case titled San Antonio Independent School District versus Rodriguez. Now, how is that racist, you may ask? This kind of structure hurts poor white kids as much as anyone else. And yes, you're right, to an extent. But to truly understand what the government did to schools, you also have to understand what it did to the housing market. Governments greatly manipulate residential markets through regulations, zoning, and other ordinances, all of which can greatly impact what kind of people live in what kind of neighborhood. Decisions about where to put a public transportation system is another governmental policy that can greatly impact just where people without means to a car live. And then you have redlining. For decades, many banks in the U.S. denied mortgages to people, mostly people of color in urban areas, preventing them from buying a home in certain neighborhoods or getting a loan to renovate their own houses. This practice, which was once backed by the U.S. government, started in the 1930s and took place across the country for decades. So you see, we did not just end up with large numbers of people of color financially trapped in lower income urban centers by accident. Decades of public policy put this structure in place, and some of these decisions were made to keep certain kids out of certain schools. Additionally, redlining has meant that homes and communities of color have been devalued for decades, therefore generating lower property taxes and poorer schools in these areas. Research from the Annenberg Institute for School Reform at Brown University finds that formerly redlined neighborhoods have significantly less per pupil revenues, larger shares of black and non-white student bodies, less diverse student populations, and lower average test scores compared with those located in neighborhoods that were not redlined. So yeah, our government schools are pretty racist. But that's not the only reason they suck. Not by a long shot. Let's jump into the 1980s. The story of the 1980s and 90s is this. A coalition to make homeschooling legal succeeded, and Republicans failed to, in any way, cut the federal government out of schools and actually ended up entrenching it. No, that's really, that's actually the gist of it. It may surprise some people to learn that homeschooling was not always legal. I can't fully expound upon this here because it was actually 50 different mini stories, which I've linked in my show notes. Every state was different. But to varying degrees, states had made homeschooling all but impossible during the 1900s. Some made parents form schools to educate at home. Some required licenses to teach your own children. And some made parents seek permission from school boards, which often would not grant it. I was born on the almost last day of 1987, and my mom homeschooled me and my siblings in both Alabama and Kentucky. At that time, homeschooling was not legal in all 50 states, and less than 1 million students nationwide were in such arrangements. We were fringe. But it didn't really feel like it. In Kentucky, which is one of the first states to legalize, we had a huge homeschooling movement around us. And it always cracks me up when I hear the teacher union talking points against homeschooling, like, oh, you won't be socialized. It's like, tell me you've never met a homeschooler without telling me you've never met a homeschooler. Most are far more articulate, outgoing, and able to engage with people outside of their small peer group than your typical government school kid. And that's because we actually get a ton of socialization. I was constantly playing sports, taking classes, going on field trips, or doing fun activities with our homeschool group. I had a ton of friends. I had my siblings. And I also didn't have to deal with bullies or being trapped in the confines of a classroom that so often beats the individuality and creativity out of kids. Also, we did school for about two to three hours a day. I got to lean into my interests, get extra help when I struggled, and then spend most of my time actually being a kid, playing outside, exploring. I got to spend my time with my family, which is one reason I think we're still extremely close, and I didn't have to wilt away at a desk from eight to three like some kind of convict. I seriously, I really do feel so sorry for kids in public schools. I cannot 
fathom doing that as a young child. And yet, we blocked this very natural option for millions of people for decades. But by 1993, this movement succeeded in getting the government off our backs, and those who've been fortunate enough to grow up in it have flourished. Homeschool students score about 72 points higher than the national average on the SAT test. Homeschoolers are at the 77th percentile on the Iowa test of basic skills. The home educated typically score 15 to 30 percentile points above public school students on standardized academic achievement tests. 78% of peer-reviewed studies on academic achievement show homeschool students perform statistically significantly better than those in institutional schools. Homeschool students score above average on achievement tests regardless of the parent's level of formal education or their family's household income. The list goes on. And I firmly believe that this is because government schools are indoctrination camps meant to teach people what to think rather than how to think, which is the entire reason I launched the show. I want everyone to have access to the logic, reason, and critical thinking skills that I was taught during my education. Not only that, but homeschooling is much cheaper than other educational options. The average family spends only $600 per kid per year. And I want to say this to parents listening, saying, I don't understand how hard it is because I don't have kids and they could never possibly do this. Yes, you can. I may not have kids, but I've seen it in action. You better believe if I did have kids, I'd move hell and high water to make it happen for them. My mother homeschooled four kids while my dad was a full-time pastor and getting his PhD. It was not easy and we were certainly not rich. It was a sacrifice for them, but it's one of the greatest gifts they ever gave me. And again, we're talking about a couple of hours a day. Not only that, but there are now all kinds of support systems for homeschooling in place. As I mentioned, I went to a cottage school from sixth to eighth grade, which is a kind of co-op. Basically, I went two days a week, wore a uniform, went to classes, took tests, and got assignments that I then did at home the other three days. And this takes a lot of the burden of, off of parents as kids advance in their education. And these kind of arrangements can often be found at local churches and they're pretty affordable. And I'm not actually even scratching the surface. Now with technology, there are so many other kinds of arrangements and programs that could help you get your kids out of government schools. Uh, my colleague at Fee, Carrie McDonald, has an excellent free ebook on our website laying these out if you're interested, so go to fee.org. While the homeschooling movement was making leaps and bounds during this time, Reagan, both Bushes, and Clinton were continuing to mess up the public school system. Reagan, though he initially claimed he wanted his education secretary to work himself out of a job, ended up expanding the Department of Education after his sleazeball of a secretary commissioned this hyperbolic report for the public called A Nation at Risk that he used to further his own authority. Reagan succumbed to the public relations of the moment, and this was really the last best chance we had to get rid of the Department of Education. Instead, its importance and power were greatly increased during this time. In 1990, President George H.W. Bush signed the Gun-Free School Zones Act, which prohibited the possession of firearms in designated school zones, making all children, teachers, and administrators sitting ducks. Notice that the era of big school shootings begins shortly after this. That's not a coincidence. In 1994, Clinton passes the Goals 2000 Educate America Act, which authorized $647 million for education reforms, including $400 million in grants to states and local school agencies. Essentially, this bill attached school funding to national curriculum standards and was the work of both Bush Sr. and Clinton. So the Department of Education is now telling teachers how and what to teach with very substantial money strings attached. And then comes George W. Bush with his No Child Left Behind garbage. No Child Left Behind did two major things. It forced states to identify schools that were failing according to scores on standardized tests, and then it told states what to do to fix those schools because central planning always works as long as it's a Republican doing it. Here's a big beef I have with the public school system, and specifically the ways the federal government started messing with the classroom. Standardized testing is a terrible way to measure education. Some kids are good test takers. Some kids are better at memorizing. None of this proves actual intelligence, knowledge, or critical thinking skills. Even if you score highly on tests, there's no reason to think that that information is actually retained long term. And much of this effort focused almost unilaterally on math and reading, as though those are the only things citizens need to be proficient in. My mother taught in the public school system for almost a decade, and I witnessed firsthand her frustrations with the structure. Teachers were not really allowed to teach in the classroom. They had to teach to test, simply ensuring their kids would know the right answers so that the teacher or the school at large were not penalized financially. She was entirely constrained from actually doing her job by these kinds of standards and penalized when she attempted to go outside the box. And that drove her away from teaching, as I bet it does many other good teachers, and it's the kids who ultimately suffer. 
And though No Child Left Behind was eventually overturned under Obama, the problems with our modern school system are still extensive and pervasive. Parents have continued to have issues with the curriculum being taught to their kids, including under Common Core and now over concerns of critical race theory. And I want to be clear, I don't really hold strong opinions of either. What I do hold strong opinions on is this. A child's education and the curriculum that they get should be determined first and foremost by the parent. Secondarily, it should be determined by the experts in education, which are the teachers, not some administrators and not some bureaucrats off in DC. If schools were still locally managed and if parents had a say in where their kids went to school, you wouldn't see these passionate battles over curriculum. A one-size-fits-all approach to education does not work for 330 million people and it's stupid to think that it ever could. And we've seen this time and time and time again. Despite all of the government's meddling in schools, central planning, and curriculum mandates, Americans are getting dumber. IQs have literally been falling since 1975, and researchers blame environmental factors like the home and schools for the decline. Even before the pandemic upended school, test scores in both reading and math declined for 13-year-old students. Out of 71 developed countries, we rank 38th in math and 24th in science. And here's where I'm about to get pissed off, because when you read them the facts, the left and the unions will always try to tell you that this is because we've defunded public schools. Read my lips. Anyone telling you that is a gaslighter and a liar. Never associate with them again. In fact, we have spent more on public schools than ever before. On average, we spend $15,000 per child per year in public schools, with large cities like DC or New York City well above that. Nearly a third of all state budget expenditures go toward education. And inflation-adjusted K-12 education spending per student has increased by 280% since 1960. In comparison, the average private school tuition across the nation is $12,350 per year. So what, what are they doing with the money? Where is it going? That's the right question, because it certainly isn't going back into the classroom where teachers are asked to provide basic supplies for their pupils, and they're often paid meager wages, and classrooms are overcrowded. But you know who is making a fortune off of public schools? Administrators. Surges in staffing and administrative bloat have become the norm across the country. From 1950 to 2009, student populations increased by 96%, while non-teaching staff increased by a whopping 702%. Furthermore, increased education spending generally isn't associated with better results. Stanford University economist Eric Hanushek reviewed nearly 400 studies on the topic and concluded that there is not a strong or consistent relationship between student performances and school resources. So anyone repeating this pernicious lie that schools are underfunded has sticky hands, and it's just making an obvious play for more of your money. You know who else is becoming a fat cat off the public education dollars? Teachers unions. Remember the NAE and AFT I mentioned back in the 1930s? They're still around and wreaking havoc. The NAE is the largest labor union in the country, and let's be clear, while I think unionizing can be a free market solution to problems in the market as long as they don't use government to force people, which is literally never the case in this country, I am unilaterally opposed to all public sector unions, which is what a teacher's union is. Anyone being paid tax dollars works for us, the people. They're paid by our money that they take involuntarily from us. They should not then be able to use that money to organize against us, lobby against us, and work against our interest. This is always wrong. Even FDR thought so. You know, if FDR and I agree on something, we're at like the bottom level of hell. And that's exactly what teachers unions have done over the years. They've always had a political angle that leans left. They've always donated heavily to the Democratic Party and candidates. They've always lobbied against parents' rights and educational choice. They've always been spending their money on lobbying and lawsuits that force people to join them. The list goes on. Their activities are sinister, and if people really wrap their minds around what they're doing in this country and the ways they're using your tax dollars against you and to tie you and your money to their own pockets, you'd be furious. Currently, AFT has revenues of about $587 million, and it pays its president, Randy Weingarten, $517,852 per year. And while it is the wealthiest, other unions have similarly bloated bank accounts, bank accounts that you funded. And over the past two years, these unions have really kicked it into high gear, lobbying heavily for school closures that were never needed based on the actual science and data that showed children were never in any real danger of COVID. They've lobbied for other policies like masking and distancing as well. And not only have they lobbied for lockdowns, they've also worked to hold kids' education hostage in exchange for a grab bag of unrelated progressive policies. 
As one example, the Los Angeles Teachers Union released a report detailing the conditions they identified for a safe reopening of schools. This document went far beyond requesting social distancing plans and personal protective equipment to an agenda that eclipsed both COVID-19 and educational matters. Specifically, it laid out policy requirements for school reopening that included passing Medicare for all at the federal level, raising state taxes, defunding the police, and imposing a moratorium on charter schools. And all of their work in this regard has had dire outcomes. Students, especially those already on the margins, are falling behind in their education, and researchers are pessimistic about their ability to make up for what's been lost. According to the Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, emergency department visits for suspected suicide attempts among adolescents jumped 31% in 2020 compared to 2019. Physical abuse of school-aged children tripled during the early months of the pandemic when widespread stay-at-home orders were in effect. In 2019, U.S. child hunger hit its lowest point in more than two decades. But then the COVID-19 pandemic arrived, wiping out years of progress in a matter of merely months. These people are frankly evil. And now that the dust is settling and parents realize and are not looking the other way at their activities, they are beginning a all-out lobbying campaign trying to gaslight the American people and claim that they never did any of this, that they never pushed for lockdowns or any of these policies. And them and them unilaterally, teachers unions need to be abolished. So I've painted a pretty grim picture here, and if I had more time, I could actually make it even worse because I've seen some things in my time. But what to do about it? What to do with a failing school system, a population that is consistently becoming dumber, classrooms that have become battlegrounds for the culture war, angry parents, powerful teachers unions, it's a mess. And I think the only solution is to recognize that the government is the last entity that should be determining the education of the nation. They have ulterior motives. Their system is systemically racist and has been all along. And as long as politicians determine curriculum, classrooms will always be a political battleground. If you have any doubt here, let's remember that when parents did finally get involved in local school board meetings, advocating for their children's best interests and doing their jobs as citizens to participate in the system, the school boards called the FBI in on them. These people are your enemies and it's time to stop pretending otherwise. But here's the good news. There is something that can be done about all of this, and it can be done locally, at the state level, where bills do still get passed, where lawmakers are still accountable to their citizens, and where you as an average citizen can reasonably get to in order to lobby on your own behalf. The policy we need is known as school choice. And though it has taken several shapes over the years, most of the liberty movement has coalesced around one model in recent years known as education savings accounts, or ESAs for short. This is the model that I've worked on. In most states, there's at least one educational freedom group already working for this as well that you could join forces with. Let me explain how it works and why this is so brilliant. Schools are currently funded in three parts, federal, state, and local dollars. Most of this comes from the state and local divisions, and this is the portion state legislatures can control, which is how we're able to cut the federal government out of the picture under this proposal. Because schools are actually overfunded, well and above private options, we actually can afford to leave the federal dollars on the table along with all of their regulations and stipulations that follow them. Under this kind of legislation, the state and local dollars go into an education savings account, kind of like a health savings account. Each family has control of the money and can use it towards defined services. They can reinvest in their public schools if they like, which surprisingly, most Americans say they do. They can use it towards private school, to homeschool, towards tuition, online classes, or on a number of supplemental educational services and supplies. The money not used each year actually rolls over and can be used towards higher high school tuitions or even towards college if the family is frugal. The model actually does not defund public schools, I wish. Uh, and that is unless all students choose to leave that school, which is rarely the case. And if it is, then that school should close because it's pretty bad. Rather, it actually leaves more money per pupil in the public school because the federal funding typically stays behind. This not only allows parents to choose the educational path that is right for each school, it forces schools to actually compete for those dollars, meaning they either improve or they close. And also meaning that other competitors would rise up in the market. Parents are desperate for this. I've seen it, especially in communities that have been trapped in failing schools for decades. The only people who oppose it are the teachers unions and the administrators who profit handsomely while our kids are left to rot under their crap supervision. Funding should follow the child. This is an obvious concept. When we give welfare to people, we don't say, now only use this at Walmart. No, we know each individual knows their needs better than central planners in DC and that most will make the best financial choices to get the most for their money. We also know that stores will compete for those dollars and new ones will open when the demand is there. If we're going to have social programs, which I am very iffy on at best, then we need to at the very least create market conditions within them that have been proven to increase outcomes. I'm talking basic competition, supply and demand. 
The choice here is clear. You either care about kids and their ability to obtain a good education, or you care about protecting fat cat bureaucrats like the teachers unions and the rotting institution of public schools. I think the choice is clear. And with parents finally awakening to the corruption in our schools during COVID, I'm hoping we finally see a movement rise up and demand educational freedom at the state level. Remember, no political movement that has achieved the support of 3.5% of the population has ever failed to achieve its goals. We can do this. All right, that's the episode, guys. Go get into good trouble, break the system, free the kids, and stay based. I'll see you next month.